But if I tell you that 50 or so lines of YAML will get you everything, and I mean everything you might need to work on an application. What if everything includes Git repos, branches, pull requests, CI workflows, scripts needed both for local development and CI, Docker file, a bunch of Kubernetes resources, and quite a few other things you might need? What if everything is really everything? And at the same time, tailor-made for your specific needs. Would you like to see it? If you do, well, welcome to Devils Toolkit, the channel where everything is custom and represented with only a few lines of YAML, which were not written by an AI. Let's talk about the only thing that truly matters in developer platforms applications. Now, that might sound as an overreaction. Sure, applications are important, but so is infrastructure and third-party apps, right? Well, yes, everything is important. Applications cannot run without physical infrastructure, and infrastructure needs third-party apps to be of any use. On top of that, we often need databases and other third-party apps to be combined with whatever we are developing. Still, it's all about our applications. We have servers so that our apps can run on them. We have Kubernetes so that we can manage our applications. We are running databases so that our applications can store data. You get the point, right? Everything we do is a result of the need to have our applications up and running and serving our users. Hence, applications are what really matters, making them arguably the focus of developer platforms. We want to be able to deploy, manage, and observe our apps. To accomplish that, we need quite a few things. We certainly need a repository where we will store application code, scripts, workflow definitions, manifests, and whatever else we might need. More often than not, we also need a place to store application state, meaning that we should have a database. Finally, we might need some infrastructure where all that will be running. That's the subject of today's video. We are going to explore how we can add everything we might need to manage applications in an internal developer platform. More specifically, we'll see how we can enable everyone to easily get a code repository with all the files needed to work and manage applications. How we can add third-party applications and infrastructure our applications might need. And finally, how we can define our applications. All that needs to be easy and accessible to anyone working in our organization. Simplicity, and I repeat, simplicity is the key today. Let's start with repositories. It all starts with the repository. We need a place where we will store code, scripts, configurations, and anything else we might be using to work on a project. Now, I'm sure that almost anyone knows how to create a Git repository and how to write some files locally and push them there. Still, it would be nice to have all that as a unified, yet customizable, and above all, simple process. So, I defined a crossplane composition that does just that. I will be using crossplane compositions to demonstrate some principles and show how we can accomplish certain objectives. You should not be limited to crossplane. You should be able to accomplish the same using other tools. The important note is to focus on what we are trying to accomplish here, rather than on specific technologies that help us do what needs to be done. Here's a claim based on that definition. This is as simple as it can get. We have a spec ID that is a unique identifier which will eventually become the repository. Further on, we are setting the public parameter to true, thus choosing to make the repository accessible to anyone, and we chose to use Go as the app language. If you ignore the fact that I implemented Go as the only choice, for now, people should be able to get different results depending on their language of choice. Here comes an important note. Typically, a developer portal would not only have APIs, like the one we just saw, and controllers that would manage the state of resources, but also some user interfaces. People might be writing YAML, like the one we are exploring here, or they might be using a web UI like Backstage or Port that would generate that YAML, or we would uh, have a custom CLI, or whichever user interface we might be building. We will not explore those today, and you will have to imagine that there are some user interfaces, meaning that writing YAML is only one of the options. All in all, we'll write and use YAML and apply it with kube control, 
and you have to imagine that your end users might have other avenues to interact with the platform. Another important note is that we are exploring examples I generated to prove a point. They do not represent everything you might need. You are in charge of the interfaces or APIs and controllers that should match your needs. Also, I will not show how I did what I did, but rather the end result. I want to show what's possible. I will leave the links to the repositories with the compositions used in this video in the description down there. Let's apply that manifest while imagining the end users generated it through some custom UI or a CLI. And take a look at what was created. We can see that it created or will soon create a repository and inside it a branch with a few repository files. Further on, once it's done with those, it will create a pull request which we could review, approve and merge to the mainline. After a while, all those resources should be available. So let's confirm just that. And that's it, at least when the repository with initial files is concerned. Much more is coming, but for now, we should clone the newly created repo and enter into it. We confirm that the new repo was created. Now let's see whether there is a pull request as well. There you go. We can see that the PR is indeed there. How about files? Now, not much was created there, yet enough to get us going before we start defining the application and third-party services. For now, there is a readme and go files. That makes sense, given that in this example, we chose go as the programming language. Now, let's merge that pull request and pull it to the local repo before we move to the next phase. Source code stored in a Git repository is only a fraction of what we might need when working on an application. We might need some scripts, workflows, Dockerfile, and quite a few other things. We'll get to those later. For now, we'll focus on third-party apps. More specifically, we'll see how we can add the PostgreSQL or any other database to the mix. We'll start by creating a directory in the newly created repo. Next, we'll copy two manifests I created earlier into the apps directory. And now we can see the definition of the database people can claim without going into nitty gritty details of everything required to run it. If you watch videos on this channel, you probably already saw this or a very similar manifest. So I won't go into much detail. We're claiming a PostgreSQL database server in AWS. It should be version 16.2, it should be small, whatever that means in AWS, it should be in US East 1 region, and it should have two databases. The second manifest is the initial password. I should have used external secrets operators to pull it from a secret store, but I was too lazy to do that, so it's in plain sight, available for any malicious person to find. Terrible thing, but that got us there fast. Now, let's apply both the password and the claim and take a look at what we got. That's a bunch of AWS resources like Internet Gateway, Security Group, the RDS Instance and others, combined with two databases and a few other things. Now, it will take a bit of time until all those are up and running. We, we will not wait for them. Instead, we'll jump right into defining the application itself and quite a few other things the application might need. Let's copy a manifest I prepared in advance and take a look at it. This one is a bit more complicated, yet still very simple compared to what it does. We are specifying information one might expect uh, to have when defining an application. There is the namespace, image, tag, port, host and ingress class name. Now, the value of the tag is interesting. It is currently set to fix me which obviously does not look like a tag. The reason for that is simple. We did not yet build a single image and therefore there is no tag we could use. We could fix that by executing Docker image build and pushing the image to the registry, but we will not do that. That would be silly. Instead, we will build images automatically whenever we push changes to the source code of the application. The problem, however, is that we do not yet have a workflow that will do that. We do not have a CI process, at least not yet. We'll see that will change in a few minutes. For now, let's see what else we have over there. Since we want that application to talk to the database we claimed earlier, we are telling it where the secret with the credentials that will be created is. 
Next, we'll tell the claim that the usage of the repository with the code is enabled and what the repo name is. With that information, the claim should be able to push to that repo additional files related to the application we are defining. Finally, we are saying that CI should be enabled. As a result, the claim should create all the files we might need to build images and perform any other CI steps. As a result of all that, we should not only have the application up and running, but also everything else, including CI workflow as well. Let's, uh, let's apply it. Now, to begin with, that claim should have created Kubernetes resources required to run the application. Let's see whether that's really the case. There we go. We got the deployment, which created the replica set, which in turn spin up a pod with a container where the application should be running. That pod, however, is failing with the error image pull message. That's normal, since it's trying to use an image that does not exist. We did not build it just yet. There's also a service for communication with the pods of the application and ingress, which allows us to talk to the app from outside the cluster. Typically, there would be quite a few other components if that would be production ready. But I did not want to complicate it more than necessary, at least not for this demo. There's more though, and we can see all the components composed from that claim by running a trace. Besides those that we already saw, or all of them represented as object resources, we can see that the branch was created and that some repository files were pushed to that branch and that finally a pull request was created. Those are the interesting ones. But before we see what exactly they are, we should wait for a few moments and confirm that all the managed resources are available. And there we go. Now that all the managed resources are available, we can confirm that what we got is what we actually Want. To begin with, there should be a new pull request, so let's list all the PRs. We can see that a pull request suspiciously named CI was created. Let's see what's inside it. Look at that. Now we're talking. We got four files that hopefully contain everything we'll need to run CI workflows every time we push changes to that repository. We will see what those files are in a moment. Now, as I already mentioned, this is only a demo. You should create compositions that match your own needs. You might use GitLab CI instead of GitHub Actions. You might be building images using build packs instead of Docker file and so on and so forth. This is me showing you what you can and should do rather than giving you the final solution. Now let's merge the PR and pull latest changes into the local repo. And now we can look at those four files that were created and pushed to the repo automatically when we claimed an application. The first in line is CI YAML. As you can probably guess, that's GitHub Actions workflow. Most of it is typical stuff you would normally do, like uh, check out, log in to a container image registry at the top, and commit and push changes back to the repo at the bottom. The middle part is a bit special. Instead of defining all the dependencies and all the operations, I have it all in a single step called all. Over there, DevBox will make sure that all the tools needed are there, and after that, it will run a script dot nu or dot nu. I prefer having all the automation defined as a script so that tasks can be executed in workflows, but also locally or anywhere else. Otherwise, we would need to define the same thing multiple times. And that's just silly, right? The script itself is written as new shell, which you should be familiar with if you're uh, watching videos in this channel. I love it. I, ju I just really love it. It's awesome. And I'm using it for all scripts and CLIs. Next, we got Dockerfile. You should be familiar with Dockerfile unless you live in a cave without internet or you just join the ranks of software nerds, right? If it's the former, I suggest moving under a bridge in a city where you can steal Wi-Fi from someone. If it's the former, I have two things to tell you. First of all, welcome. Second, I don't understand how you got this far into this video. All this must sound uh, Chinese to you, unless you're from China, in which case I'll change it to, I don't know, Japanese. Anyways, we also got a DevBox file. That one defines all the packages needed to execute CI operations, no matter where we're executing them from. This one is short, with only new shell and go. It's a demo, right? And I'm sure you will have more. Finally, there is that script that defines all the commands for running CI processes as a whole or separately. 
I won't go into details of that script since it should be easy to understand what it's doing if you're familiar with Nushell. If you're not, please watch that video over there. Now, let's go back to the Kubernetes cluster where the application is running. As we can see, the pod is still not running. Its status is image pull back off, which was to be expected since we did not yet build the image nor we configured it to use it. However, now we have everything we need to do that. So let's just do it. Let's run the first build of our CI. Mm. Before we run CI, we need to add a secret. That could be part of the composition as well, but I left it as a manual action as a security precaution. At least that sounds like a better excuse than admitting that I was too lazy to edit. Actually, there is one more manual action we should perform before we run CI workflow. We need to open repository settings and select read and write permissions in the workflow permissions section. And that's it. Now we are truly, truly ready. From here on, all we would be doing is writing code of the application and pushing changes to the repo. However, since we already made a few modifications to the files, we can skip working on the code and just add and commit and push changes. Now we need to wait for a few moments. Since it can be boring to stare at a blank screen, we'll watch the progress of the GitHub Actions workflow. Look at it go. It did repo checkout, it set up camo required to build container images with Docker. It did the login to GHCR, the container image registry we are using, and it installed DevBox. That was all preparation, and from there on, it executed all the steps required for CI, since they are all in the Nushell script. Among other things, that script built and pushed the image and made changes to the application manifest, and to finish it all off, it committed those changes and pushed them to the registry. The rest is GitHub Actions automatically in a process. It's a success. We did it. Yeah? Rejoice. Should we confirm that what we think happened really happened? Hmm? Let's do it. Let's pull the changes from GitHub. We can see that apps, silly demo YAML changed automatically. That's really the only output of the pipeline. That's the final outcome. So let's take a look at it. The spec parameters tag is what changed in that manifest. At the very end of the CI pipeline, after it built the image, it updated that file by adding the tag of the image it built. As a reminder, let's take another look at the resources in the cluster. We can see that the pod is still failing with the image pull back off status. Back when we applied those manifests, we did not have the image of the application. Now we do, and our manifest is up to date. Normally, we would not need to do anything to deploy the new release of the application. We should have Argo CD or Flux watching that repository and applying changes to the cluster. However, I did not prepare that part for this demo, assuming that you're already using or at least familiar with GitOps. So instead of relying on auto synchronization through Argo or Flux, we'll apply that manifest and take another look at the resources in the cluster. There we go, the pod is running, the application is serving our users, and all it took is a few lines of YAML that gave us a new repository with all the scripts, workflow, docker file, initial source code, and anything else we might need. We also got a PostgreSQL database server in the hyperscaler of choice, as well as all the Kubernetes resources needed to run the application. The only thing that would make developers happier than what we did today is a tap on the back, followed with the words, you're doing great, right? Here's a substantial increase in your salary or something like that. If you're new to Crossplane, you will find the link to the playlist with the full tutorial in the description. Otherwise, if you're already experienced with it, you might want to take a look at the code of the compositions I used today. The links are in the description as well. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one. Cheers.